Good afternoon, Madam High Commissioner, Ch Chairperson, distinguished delegates, panelists, and civil society representatives. I'm going to begin with three short narratives. The first one is, uh, on 17th May 2008, Christie Jayanti Malar, 38, and Rukmani, 40, committed suicide. Police reports said that they were hugging each other when they set themselves ablaze and succumbed to the wounds. Christie and Rukmani had been lovers for the past 10 years against the wishes of their natal families and their husbands. This suicide was the latest of the eight lesbian suicides that we heard about from the beginning of 2008 in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu alone. More than 35 lesbian couples are reported to have committed suicide in the Indian state of Kerala in the past 12 years. And these are only reported cases. This is from a protest letter by civil society organizations. The second narrative is from an article on hijras that appeared in the Deccan Herald on the 5th of November 2008. Now hijras are a subculture a cultural sub, uh, subgroup that is very particular to the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and they are not equivalent to transgender. It is very particular to the Indian subcontinent. They are not welcome in restaurants. Auto drivers don't take them. Passengers refuse to sit near them in buses. Walking down the street is tough. Getting a passport or opening a bank account is almost impossible. And they are randomly picked up by the police and beaten mercilessly. Their crime is not fitting into the gender roles society has determined. The third narrative is uh, from an open letter to the Vice Chancellor of Aligarh Muslim University on the 8th of April 2010. Dear Sir, you are perhaps aware that Professor Siras, a teacher at your university and a poet, was found dead yesterday in his sad room where he was forced to move after being turned out of the university accommodation. It is immaterial whether he committed suicide or sustained a heart attack. You, sir, are the signatory on his death warrant. By condemning his choices of love and life, by publicly so shaming him, and by colluding with those who turned his most private, intimate moments into sordid TV reality shows, you effectively pushed him to the brink of death. It is not without irony, sir, that it is you facing multiple charges of corruption and embezzlement who should be so morally exercised by an individual's freedom and legal one to love whom one desires. These are just three narratives that give us the range of violations that occur in India because of people's sexual orientation and gender identity. The last incident of Professor Cyrus was particularly shocking as it came less than a year after the historic 2nd July 2009 judgment of the Delhi High Court that held that criminalization of consensual sex between adults in private violates the Constitution's guarantees of dignity, equality, and freedom from discrimination based on sexual orientation. The four concepts of dignity, privacy, equality, and non-discrimination form the basis of the judgment. What the judgment also introduced is the concept of constitutional morality as opposed to popular and or majoritarian morality. This constitutional morality is based on liberal demo democratic ideal ideals that underlie the Indian constitution, not on any particular religious or cultural tradition. This concept is derived from Dr. Ambedkar, architect of the Indian constitution, who was a Dalit and fought against caste-based discrimination all his life. The judgment ended one phase of the struggle. It had been eight long years. In 2001, NAS Foundation India filed a public interest litigation in the Delhi High Court, challenging the constitutional validity of Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code. NAS had observed in its HIV AIDS work that Section 377 was one of the biggest barriers to effective HIV AIDS prevention work because it criminalized a section of the population that it worked with, namely men who have sex with men. Police routinely use this law to intimidate, harass, and extort money and seek sexual favors from men who had sex with men and hijras. 
In 2006, Voices Against 377 became a co-petitioner to this case, providing affidavits to the court from people who had faced violence and discrimination because of their sexual orientation and gender identity. Voices Against 377 is a broad-based coalition of organizations in Delhi working on sexuality and gender issues, women's, child, health and human rights, and LGBTI issues. CRIA, the organization that I work with, is one of the organizations that's part of Voices Against 377. The coalition came into being in late 2003 because we felt that Section 377 not only, is not only about violence and discrimination base, faced on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. It was all that and much more. We could not sit back and say that the issue was not ours, just as we could not turn our heads away from violence and discrimination faced by Dalits or Muslims or any other group that faced violence and discrimination. As human rights organizations, it only made logical sense that we support issues of choice, equality, and non-discrimination. We wanted to make consent as the standard and not morality. For Korea and Voices, we had a work cut out. In 2004, we worked with the media, other social movements, health professionals, and the general public, creating awareness on sexual orientation and gender identity, its link to broader sexuality and human rights issues, making the connection between consent, choice, autonomy, and human rights. Consent, choice, and autonomy are particularly important in the Indian context with respect to choosing one's partner. Many young women and men who choose their own partners face a lot of violence from their family members and sometimes the entire village, especially if they choose partners out of their caste or religion. Uh, I think it has to be a multi-pronged approach, whether it's uh, uh, the Human Rights Council, whether it's the UN system, whether it's uh, the kind of work that we need to do back in our own countries. Uh, within the Human Rights Council, um, I, I think um, sexual orientation and gender identity need, sh uh, should not be seen as a stand-alone uh, you know, issue to work with. Uh, if uh, one could uh, work towards the independence of special procedures um, uh, and uh, um, and, and, and ensure that special procedures um, you know, had, have that independence, whether they are reporting on uh, you know, whatever mandates they are reporting on. Um, I think that would in itself uh, provide space for uh, addressing issues like uh, sexual orientation and uh, gender identity. Uh, and also uh, in terms of um, um, the gains that we have made in terms of reproductive health and sexual health and rights, I think uh, states uh, must be prepared to, uh, you know, protect the gains that have already been made and uh, and when negotiations are happening, because that again is very important because we can't lose ground uh, on gains that that we have made. Uh, in terms of um, uh, countrywide work, I, I think uh, what has been helpful. Uh, uh, for us in India, uh, and we've been able to achieve uh, the judgment that the uh, judgment that we have is that we've actually worked as a movement, and it has not been the work of one person. It has been the work of many people who have worked for uh, at least a decade to uh, come to this point where we have this fantastic uh, judgment. And now our work is to ensure that uh, a, one is uh, that the judgment uh, and that the case in the Supreme Court goes in our favor, and secondly, also uh, to ensure that. Uh, uh, as long as the law stays, the implementation, uh, you know, of this, uh, the law.